At the turn of the century, the normally carefree streets of the Crescent City were on edge as a madman snuck in and attacked New Orleanians with weapons found inside their own homes. But what could stop him? The police? Vigilantes? Or the sweet, sweet sounds of the very jazz that the city created? This week's episode is The Axeman of New Orleans. Fills with dread, probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinister who? Love the city of New Orleans. I used to live there. Big fan. Yeah, you went to college there. Briefly. How was partying there while you were in college? I was uh, very stupid because I chose not to drink during the time that I lived in New Orleans. Oh, that sounds smart to me. Uh, <laughs> Did was... you go there for all of undergrad? Mm-mm. I went. I started there in August 2005, and then I was evacuated for Hurricane Katrina. Mm-hmm. I stayed at the LSU boys dorm for a couple days and then went to SMU for a semester. Went back to New Orleans. Oh, while the city was on lockdown still? SMU basically said, if you're a displaced student in the area, come for free. Oh, wow. And come stay here. Good for SMU. Study here, yeah. And so then I went back to New Orleans in January, and I went there for one semester, and then I transferred. I went back to Dallas for like a year. I went to Eastfield for a minute, worked, worked at Magic Time Machine. Then I went to uh, Chicago. What what made you... Oh, so then... You, this is before you came. You went to SMU grad school. Okay, yeah, so I always it, planned it, on going to Chicago. So initially, I thought I would go to Loyola New Orleans undergrad, mm-hmm. and then I would go to like law school. Or I, at the time, I was like, "Do I want to go to law school? Do I want to get an MFA in writing? Like, what mm-hmm. do I want to do?" So I decided to just uh, accelerate my move to Chicago by several years. Okay. And then moved there. In. But while you were in New Orleans, you enjoyed it. Oh, I loved it so much. Yeah, the food is so good. City. I went back uh, in, in February of 2019, and I was so pleased to find my very favorite ice cream parlor mm. it was still there, Creole Creamery. Oh. They put whole chunks. I'm allergic to cake, and I ate ice cream with red velvet cake you in it. You said, this is worth it. A hundred percent. I said, I said I, if it's as good as I remember, 10 years later, 10... 13 years later, because I lived there in 2006, 2007. <laughs> I was like, surely. Did you break out in a rash? Oh, yeah. I was bad. <laughs> I was very sick. It was, You're like, it was worth it. Kill me. It was so good. Oh, man. Fuck me up. But it was great. Uh, it was very worth it. So yeah. I love good old New Orleans. I am a big fan of New Orleans. I need to probably cut back on the ice cream, though, considering what happened to me at a networking function. <laughs> I was waiting to Nobody tell you. Nobody can see my face right now. Christy's got the uh, that emoji with just all the teeth showing. Yeah. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I was wearing what I thought to be a flattering dress. Mm. Black at the top. And then it's like an empire waist kind mm-hmm. of with black and red flowers on the bottom. There's actually a picture of me wearing I've seen it. you in this dress. Yeah, and I wear it. And I have a navy one and a black one. And I'm, I, I can't I, do empire waist. Oh, yeah. Well, I, this is... I thought this it was flat. I was wearing Empire Waste when this happened to me as well. That's right, because the meatball yes. stitch. Yeah. So I'm standing in line. There's a man in front of me. He's an older gentleman, probably, you know, in his 60s. He has on glasses, a button-down, short sleeve Dwight Schrute-esque button-down shirt. And You did not know this man. Did not know him. It was a networking function for a friend of mine, a law firm that he works at. And beside me was a woman. She and I were kind of waiting to get that we were in the buffet line for mm-hmm. hors d'oeuvres. Tiny tacos. I wanted them so Ooh, bad. A little a tiny, tiny hard shell yeah. tacos. I was so excited. And he Anything had, tiny is cute. It's to so eat. cute. And yeah. they had tiny meatballs, tiny nachos. Oh. It was great. They always do it right. What is this? A meatball for ants? For babies. It's a baby meatball. So I was waiting and so he and my two male friends from law school were behind me. And this man, plate full, turns around apropos of nothing, looks me in the eye and says, no, I normally don't say stuff like this. And I thought, and he That's sort of, where you stop. He looks me up and down. And I thought, I'm about to be sexually harassed, <laughs> which is happens to women all the time. Sure. And this guy looks like he's honestly would have preferred it. A hundred percent. You got some nice knockers. Yeah. That would have been great. Fine. Fantastic. Yeah. Whatever you want to say. But he goes, I don't normally say stuff like this, but I 100% for sure know that you're pregnant right now. Okay. Let's stop. 
everyone <laughs> everyone right now is going what and gasping i have 100 i have some no. questions because i Please. heard this story right after it happened i was freaking out and i texted christy immediately these people were trying to network with me i was like shut up go away i have to text my friend <laughs> all and all i did was send meme after meme of incredulous faces <laughs> the it's the smh shaking my head <laughs> gifts okay but here so since then i've thought of some questions <laughs> What was his point? Thank you. Why? I mean, on, like, were you drinking? Yes. So do you think the next line was going to be, and you should put that down? No, because I looked at him. My friends behind me said, what did he say? The woman behind me's eyes were as big as pancakes. I mean, she was just like, oh. Because she knows you. No, I don't know this lady. This is a strange lady beside oh, me. Oh, but she knows no man should ever say this to a woman, even if a baby's coming out of her vagina. That's what I said. This is none of your business, sir. Please don't comment on Whatever my body. Whatever my situation is, Please do not comment on my body. Ever. And so she's looking at me. I'm holding a half-drunk glass of Prosecco, my Bev of choice. And he looks at me and I said, what? And he said, I just, I'm sorry, my niece is pregnant, so I for sure know that you're pregnant right now, for sure. Uh, fun fact, buddy, I was on my period at the time. I was like, I for sure am not. I looked at him, I said, well, I'm drinking right now. So. What's his, again, what the, who gives a shit if your niece is pregnant? Thank you. And then he looks at my drink and he went, oh. So clearly it wasn't the drinking thing because he kind of like, oh. And the lady next to me goes, well, one of you's got to be wrong because she's got a drink. And he said, oh, <laughs> All right, stop kidding with me. I know. Okay, are you embellishing? <laughs> no, not even. My friends Ian and Andrew were behind me and mouths agape <laughs> the whole time. They didn't he know. He tried to, to argue with you. Yes, he started. He goes, All right, come on. Come on. That's funny. That's real funny now. I said, um, it's not a joke. I'm for sure not pregnant, but I tell you what I am. I am going to throw away and burn this dress and I'm going to go home and kill myself, <laughs> which is a very dramatic thing to say. And I shouldn't joke about that. But in the moment, I was about to cry at a I professional function. I would have cried for sure. And he looked at me and he said, oh, you're not, you're not kidding. And I said, no. And he said, oh, maybe I'll go home and kill myself. And I said, maybe you should because you're never going to recover from this. Again, not a choice thing interaction but i was very upset and it was very uncomfortable and he just walked away yeah he just looked down at his tiny tacos and walked away and i was like well and my friend's like you should still eat and i said i don't want to eat i just got told i was yeah. pregnant. and to be i would have left i would have taken those tiny tacos gone to my car and <laughs> cried while i ate all of them <laughs> much like the meatball when i was told by a man trying to give me a meatball oh, at least he was giving you when are you do um i don't know 20 years i guess <laughs> <laughs> you're like i'm due to eat, not eat this meatball i was very upset so i just i asked my guy friends who both of whom are very honest they're both married so i don't know maybe they wouldn't but i feel like both of them would be like honest if i said do i truly look pregnant in this and they both were like no it's it doesn't look like a maternity dress and it doesn't like it's not accentuating your Empire stomach waist can be unflattering however again even if you are 100% pregnant and clearly look pregnant, it is nobody's business to say to anybody, I 100% know you're pregnant. I, and you don't know anything. What do you, you don't know unless, like I said, unless you see a baby coming out. But what was so the he, point? He was trying to relate to you somehow because his niece was pregnant and he thought you guys were going to have some kind of connection the other because... His niece is pregnant, and then you're pregnant. So two two people that don't even know each other are gonna somehow you're gonna have something to talk about. I guess so. And he the the weird part was that it was apropos of nothing. I didn't tap on his shoulder. I didn't say, "Oh man, I'm sure I'm hungry." Which means he was obviously looking at you for a while. Yeah, his too. back was turned to me, and then as I was sauntered up behind him in line, then he turned around and said it to me. Uh, and then yeah, like I said, the lady next to me was just in shock and then my guy friends were in shock and said hey you know first of all you don't look pregnant are you okay do you want us to throw them out and i didn't want to make a big scene because it's kind of a professional like networking yeah deal. well also you're embarrassed and you don't want to cause any more attention i don't have to explain that the pregnant lady yeah. throwing everyone out <laughs> yeah so it was very awful and don't i don't mind her her hormones are out of control <laughs> she's pregnant she's growing a human she's life. obviously pregnant yeah she's growing a human life so so did was... you ever talk the rest of the event I didn't talk to him anymore. That's what I mean. No, I did see though. I looked over my shoulder and he's the type of guy when he's talking to you, he leans close to you and puts his arm around oh, your shoulder and pulls you close. No. You don't need to touch me to talk to me, man. No. What never. the fuck? 
So I was like, oh, you're that guy. Like, you're one of those. So I, you know, you can, my mom used so, to say, well, my kid would make fun of you and I would go, so-and-so made fun of me. And she'd go, oh, that person's an idiot. Consider the source. Yeah. And so I looked at him. I was like, oh, you're the kind of shit a- shithead that like touches women when he talks to him. So while he was saying this to you, he had his arm around you and was pulling you towards no, him? No, no. Luckily, he had oh, his, okay. his, he was putting tacos on his plate, okay, so his gotcha. hands were otherwise... The tacos like, created a safe zone. It created a taco barrier. <laughs> but it was wow. still very horrifying. That is horrifying. I'm so sorry you had I to deal with that. I was very embarrassed, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to leave and go pick up a cake for my boyfriend's birthday, <laughs> and I'm going to eat that cake. <laughs> and I'm going to eat it by myself. <laughs> I don't care. Because I am with child, and I have the right <laughs> to do that. for two. <laughs> I it is uh, just a PSA don't to ever. all of our listeners, male and female. Don't ever ask a woman if she's pregnant. God, no. Never. Even if you're like, she obviously, without a doubt in my mind, has to be pregnant. There's always a chance she's not. And even if she is, it's none of your goddamn business. And also, I've known situations where people have been pregnant and something happens. Yeah. And they're going to have to like yes. do a yes. procedure where you there's not You never know gonna be somebody's baby. story. It's... It is none of your business. Stay in your lane. Unless it's the baby shower in her honor and she's like, thanks for the gifts for my fetus that's yes. going to enjoy yeah. them in three Baby months. shower. Maybe you talk about it then. Yes. Of all other times, don't. Don't touch people's pregnancy no. belly. No. Don't touch my non-pregnant belly. Oh, God, no. <laughs> That's when I was pregnant. I'm like, would you ever touch my stomach if I didn't have a baby in here? What about there being a baby inside me right now? Everyone thinks it's okay. Strangers, people, you know, whatever, to now lay your hands on me. There's a very short list of anybody ever that's allowed to touch me. Yeah. Don't hug me for no reason. It's like people are like, what do we live in a world where we can't hug each other anymore? I'm like, I don't want to hug you. <laughs> Did you ever think about that? That maybe you want to mash my tits against people you. people if I can hug them before I, do, I hug I them. ask my nieces and stuff, may I give you a hug? Yeah. And I'll say, do you want to come sit with me? I'm not like, come get in my lap. Get yeah. over here. And you mash them down yeah. to you. No, you. I, I'm, I am trying to perpetuate that the norm is that and i've I'm, asked consent my oldest niece it was one of her birthdays and some like far off cousin uncle somebody of somebody you know somebody that's related you know not really that close and she don't fucking know who you are and she was sitting with me and you know she's sitting with bitchy aunt heather and he's like come over here give me a kiss and she was like no mm-hmm. and he's like all right all right that's enough get over here i said she said no and i said do you want to give him a kiss and she said no and i said she doesn't want to give you a kiss and he was like oh I was like, it's, first of all, it's her fucking birthday. Get the hell out of here. But it, you're no. teaching them at such a young age that they don't have dominion. S- yes. No. Yes. That somebody else has rights over your body. Don't comment on my body. Don't touch my body mm-hmm. unless you are, like I said, there's a very short list of people. Yeah. But wow. Well, anyway. I all still, that all that to be said. I still never got a tiny taco. You didn't get one? No. I got two. Well, I got another Prosecco. Oh. <laughs> drown, my, drown my sorrows. But I will say, like, I... At the, it was, it's one thing to be mistaken for being pregnant. That mm-hmm. sucks. Mm-hmm. That's a stupid thing. But it's quite another to have someone argue with you. Yeah, that's insanity. Pure insanity. <laughs> that was like, that's why I said the most bizarre, horrifying thing happened to me. And it's horrifying for someone to say, hey, I think you look like you're pregnant. But it's so bizarre to have someone go, nah. All right. Quit yeah. joking. And I'm like, do you want me to pull my tampon out and put it in your beer <laughs> right now? Have, oh, God. Like, <laughs> totally should have. <laughs> what? What That's am I a whole do- new term for red beer. God. And what I is- apologize for that joke. <laughs> red stripe. <laughs> red beer is where you dump tomato juice in a beer. Oh, okay. They're I was great for hangovers. Red stripe. Uh, or like, cl- is that clamato? That's a different thing. Clamato? Though. Yeah. Gah. Some people like it. I'm not a fan. I'm not here to judge if you're in a drink. No, if you like Kalano, do it up. You do you. But yeah, Much like I ruined otters for everyone, I just ruined red beers. <laughs> I'm on a streak. You know what? You know Keep who else was on a streak? Dude, this guy. I was like, how am I going to segue into this one after this story? <laughs> Some sort of a blood Found connection. Found a way. <laughs> There's always a way. The Axe Man of New Orleans went on quite a streak for a year and a half. The old Axe Man in New Orleans. Mm. Good old New Orleans. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. Neither of us are pregnant. No, not right now, but <laughs> maybe, who knows, maybe he's a fortune teller. Oh, Maybe. But I was, like I said, considering the time of the month Considering, it was, yeah, it so wasn't. I think you're right. No, I think he was just an ignorant old man <laughs> that had kids, no wits about him. Well, we are talking this week about the Axeman of New Orleans. I say New Orleans. Do you yeah. say New Orleans no, or New Orleans? Normal folks. Most people. Unless you have an accent. I once, told, I once had somebody tell me, unless you're from New Orleans, you shouldn't call it New Orleans. Correct. 
Well, I am not from New Orleans, and I'm still going to call it New Orleans. What do they say you should call it? New Orleans. I don't think that's right. But you're saying... I always say New Orleans. Okay, so you don't have to be from there to say New Orleans. No, I think that's okay. the regular way to say it. Well, then, whoever told me that is a BFI. I don't so, remember who get it was. on out of here. But, well, let's get into it. From May of 1918 to October of 1919... Residents of New Orleans lived in terror, and the city teetered on the brink of panic as a string of gruesome murders reminiscent of Jack the Ripper plagued the Big Easy. Nicknamed for his weapon of choice, the Axeman all but held the city hostage for a year and a half as he broke into homes in the middle of the night, brutally attacked his sleeping victims, and then fled into the dark cover of night. And this was back, you know, there wasn't a lot of crime like this going on where it was normally you know there were vendettas right. or there were robberies or something this was just violent for violence sake senseless murders that no one could make sense of correct there was no clear motive right while no one knows for sure how many people died at the hands of the axe man by the time the killing spree came to an abrupt end at least six people had been murdered in a bloody fashion with many more gravely injured and they named him the Axeman in the New Orleans Times Picayune. They kind of gave him this moniker once. It's maybe the best serial killer it's so nickname. Good. It's such a. I it's don't a like to. You know us. We don't like to glorify the bad guys. No. But this is a good name. It's a good name. He was a terrible person. Correct. He had a good name. And and he didn't even make it up himself. No, no. He w- he can't even give himself credit. I guess for it's that. a moniker. I like that word. Moniker. It's yes. A moniker. It's a moniker. On May 23, 1918, the Axeman claimed his first victims. Jake and Andrew Maggio were sound asleep in their room when they heard what sounded like groaning coming from their brother Joseph's room. While Joseph and his wife Catherine lived in a separate home than Jake and Andrew, the two bedrooms shared a wall. Jake banged on the wall, and when he didn't get a response, woke up Andrew to go investigate. Share a wall with your brothers. They're going to hear some stuff. Everybody's hearing, yeah. He's hearing groaning. Probably wasn't the first time he heard some groaning. My college roommate, I could hear everything. And they would Yikes. do three things. Oh, God. They would fight. They would fuck. And they would watch Jersey Shore all so loud. Man, equal that is volume. Kind of a fun trio, though. <laughs> that is the holy trinity. Yeah, right Jim Tan Laundry. They had fight, fuck Jersey Shore. <laughs> yeah. That's what I used a Jim Tan Laundry joke the other day. Did you really? Yeah, it wasn't I never Jim Tan Laundry. La- oh, you didn't watch mm-hmm. Jersey Shore? It is. Great. <laughs> I I'm so excited right now. It is so good. Oh my god. They are fun characters. Oh, they are man. some fun yeah, I never characters. I did There's see... some problematic things, but they are some fun characters. DJ Polly D opened for the mm. Backstreet Boys on tour. Okay. And he came out and was like, DJ Polly D yeah. he could play yeah. an iPod DJ okay. DJ Polly D knew how to he get he... the party pumping. Oh yes. They I just all imagine knew how that to get the party he pumping. hung out with the Backstreet Boys on tour. Like, probably. You guys want to go do shots? Yeah. And they're all like, no, we have children. He was probably too intense for the Backstreet <laughs> so Boys. Saying, they're like, we want to go to bed. Yeah, <laughs> Our exactly. Tour bus. Well, when the brothers went outside and around to Joseph's rear kitchen door, they saw that a lower wooden panel had been removed from the door, presumably by the wood chisel that they also discovered. That was Apparently that wood chisel was a pretty popular break-in tool at the mm. time. Nervously and with caution, the brothers entered the house and made their way to Joseph's bedroom. It was here they discovered a gruesome sight. Joseph lay on the bed, blood pouring from the deep gashes on his head. Draped over him was his wife Catherine's limp, lifeless body. Still alive, Joseph stared pleadingly at his brothers for a few moments before taking his last breath. It's very unfortunate. That is a very unfortunate thing to walk into. You feel helpless. You're powerless. You can't do anything. You, it's shocking. That is the last thing you thought you were going to walk into. Yeah. Police were called and soon pieced together the events of the night. As Joseph and Catherine Maggio lay sleeping above the grocery store they owned, the unknown assailant broke into the home and attacked the couple with a straight razor and Joseph's own axe. Joseph's skull had been fractured by the axe and his throat deeply cut with the razor. Catherine's throat was also sliced, nearly decapitating her causing her to eventually asphyxiate on her own blood. Yeah, again, this is just grisly, gruesome in a city where I'm sure there were some, like, you know, knifings in alleyways and whatnot. But this was a whole new ballgame. This was, like, torturous. The murderer's bloody clothes were found in the bathroom, indicating he had taken the time to change before fleeing the scene. It was here, in the bathtub, the bloody axe was also discovered. No money or valuables had been taken despite being out in plain sight, leading police to quickly rule out robbery as a motivation. So now you're like, this 
makes no sense. Yeah. Why would he do this if he wasn't here to steal the money? There was a safe out. There was jewelry out. Mm-hmm. There was some cash out. All of that was left untouched. No motivation. Yes. So what would be the reasoning here? Just murder for murder's sake. Mm. Just down the block in the yard of a neighboring property, the razor used in the attack was found. It belonged to Joseph's brother, Andrew, a barber. That's not good. No, for Andrew. that is not good for Andrew. Andrew was adamant he had nothing to do with the murders, but was arrested two days later. A few days later, he was released due to lack of evidence linking him to the crime. Uh, as we'll see throughout this, I mean, they're pretty loose with when they, and they just arrest someone. It's ask gonna questions. going to be a pattern of <laughs> let's just arrest the first person that we think may have done this. Yeah, and then we'll figure it out. And then uh, yeah, ask questions later. Arrest first, ask questions later. Yeah, they didn't really have Miranda warnings or anything like that back then. <laughs> was that not a thing back then? No, Miranda was nineteen seventy three. Okay, seventy five. Interesting. I bet that's an interesting case as to, mm-hmm. is Miranda the case that mm-hmm. it happened? Miranda versus the United States. And they, this person sued because they were not read their mm-hmm. rights. Interesting. And the well, court says changed, there are... Changed our world. Thank you. Miranda. We always jokingly say in like the deal world, you don't want your client's name to be at the top. And similarly with criminal. Really, you never want right. your name to be at the top and in, in the header of the case because it means that something bad happened. And, or... Maybe it did something really good, though, and like it, Roe versus it, Wade. Change is true, and then changes it. Mm-hmm. Just a month after the first attacks, the axe moon struck again on June 27, 1918. Shortly before sunrise, Louis Bessemer, a grocer just like Maggio, and his mistress, Harriet Lowe, were asleep in the back of his grocery store. The two were attacked with an axe that belonged to Bessemer and left to die. Damn, you trying to bang your mistress, and that's, that's one way to get caught, cheating. Apparently, the wife was in Cincinnati when all this happened. So imagine you get a call. Your husband's been attacked with an axe. Also, he's been cheating on you. And And you're like, leave him to die. (laughs) Leave him in the hospital. The couple was found a few hours later by a bakery truck delivery driver who discovered the two on the floor in a pool of blood. Though severely injured, both Louis and Harriet had managed to survive and later vaguely remembered their attacker. Okay. 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 Harriet. 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 Harriet Harriet's about to. This is. We're quoting Harriet. Correct. Okay. Harriet described him as a mulatto, an archaic and now offensive term for someone of mixed race. Harriet also said a lot of stuff to the newspapers. Yes. She was pretty free. She was pretty fast and loose with her quotes. She was a loose cannon. Yes. Well, however, that did not stop police from wrongfully arresting Louis Obacon, a 41 year old African American man who had been working at Bessemer's store a week prior to the attacks, who they later released due to lack of evidence. There it is. <laughs> Every time. Once again. Pull him in. Harriet quickly became the center of a media circus due to her false and scandalous accusations of not only Ubicon, but also her lover, Louis Bessemer. Police had discovered a series of letters in German, Russian, and Yiddish inside a trunk in Bessemer's home, leading government officials to speculate Bessemer might in fact be a German spy. Harriet told the police she also believed he was a spy, which led to his immediate arrest. People in the early to early 1900s to like maybe the 1940s, you just get accused of being a spy. Yeah. Like Isn't that crazy? It's like the Salem witch trials. Yeah. You're a spy. No, I'm not. Prove that you're not it's a spy. Like, Do you're you pregnant. float in the no, river? No, I'm not. Prove you're not pregnant. <laughs> Do you float in this river? <laughs> it's like, no. It's like, do you really want to argue with me about this? Yeah. I mean, that was a real... We always talk about things that... You see in movies that you thought would be a real threat, but never yeah. were. <laughs> being accused of being, being a spy. accused of being a spy was a real threat for a lot of people really for was. like twenty years. This guy was trying to write letters to people. Yeah, like, we don't know what this says. Maybe so he's we a assume. poet. He's just trying to get published. He was trying to practice his different languages and better himself. <laughs> and now he's being accused of being a spy. Or he was a damn spy. Well, realizing they had been completely misled, police released Bessemer two days after they had arrested him. However, Harriet stuck to her guns and several weeks later on her deathbed, once again claimed it was Bessemer who had attacked her and that he was a German spy. You know, you gotta dig in. Again, Bessemer was arrested and spent nine months in prison before finally being released May 1st, 1919, after a mere 10 minute jury deliberation. I wonder, too, if he if they something went wrong in their relationship and she thought, I know how I'll get you. No, the the newspaper and reports have since said that they 100% were just taking jabs at each other in the media and with the police to try because they were found out. Yeah. No one knew that she was the mistress 
when they showed up because she was covered in blood, they assumed it was his wife. Oh. Then his wife shows up from Cincinnati. It comes out in the newspaper that she's the mistress. Scandalous. She gets very upset with the mayor of New Orleans for allowing it to be published and goes on like a personal vendetta against him to just trash his name and the chief of police. And then they start taking jabs at each other in the media because they're... You know, high they're, society. They're, quarrel, they're quarreling lovers. Yes, at this point, it's there's a lot of bad blood. Like a, they're vicious, and you're. I mean, it's your reputation. A woman scorned. Well, and it's your reputation or his, or you know, your reputation or hers. Yes. So if you can take jabs, take jabs. The police kind of dismissed her. All of her comments as just being a jilted lover, and she was just kind of looking for media attention. Well, and at the time too that the Times Picayune would just publish anything about the axe man. So they're like, "Well, you have another comment?" Yeah. yeah. So she knew she had a platform. Around dusk on August 5th, 1918, Anna Schneider, who was 8 months pregnant, awoke to find a dark figure looming over her bed. She later recalled seeing the glint of an axe blade before everything turned to black. My literal worst nightmare, waking yes. up to find somebody over me. When we were t- reading about Ted Bundy, that's all I could just be it's terrifying. No, I'm going to, yeah, it's going to be hard Even to sleep Even Golden tonight. State Killer, any of them, I'm just always worried that that is going to happen. Even though I have an alarm, I've got dogs. Same. I don't think it would. It's you still a know. fear. God. Still a very real fear I have. No, I'm going to have trouble going to sleep Oh, tonight. no. Watch The Office. <laughs> That'll help. After being repeatedly bashed in the face with an axe... Anna was left to die. Shortly after midnight, her husband arrived home to find his wife, her face covered in blood, and her scalp split open. It's very upsetting. Especially she's eight months she's pregnant. Eight months Can pregnant you imagine how upsetting that would be? Covered in blood, and just unconscious. Luckily, Anna survived the attack and went on to deliver a healthy baby girl two days later. In 1918. Authorities once again made an arrest with little to no evidence, this time taking in an ex-con named James Gleason who, like the prior suspects, they were forced to release due to no evidence. Don't go walking around a crime scene. They will snatch you yes. up. Yeah. <laughs> you don't even really have to be. You're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. You ever been to jail? Yeah, one time. All right. Well, you're going again. You sound like good <laughs> enough to me. This poor woman goes through a horrific and heinous attack. And then two days later gives birth naturally christ almighty what a week she has had and the baby was perfectly healthy and she i fine. wonder if she probably went into labor earlier than yeah. she should have because of the trauma so Definitely. thank god that the little girl was healthy but can you imagine birth is the craziest thing i've ever been through in my entire life it was a wild ride much less having an axe yes. attack if i had just been brutally attacked and my head's all stitched up and you're in pain and can you imagine 1918 stitches are not the best no. it's not like glue and staples like nowadays no and you're i mean i don't think 1918 bursts were the best either no. there was a she was a trooper and it gets a golden star for all that jeez well like the other attacks no valuables or money had been taken and for the first time, police began to suspect all the attacks were related. And I think the chief of police started putting it all together. Yeah. Seeing this kind of no motivation, their stuff left, the way they were getting in. The MO was all there. Correct. Five days later, police suspicions were further confirmed that these brutal attacks were connected when yet another grocer, Joseph Romano, fell victim to the Axeman. The elderly grocer lived with his two nieces. On the night of August 10th, the girls awoke to the sound of commotion taking place in their uncle's bedroom. When the girls entered Joseph's room, they discovered their uncle laying there bleeding from the head as his assailant, a dark-skinned, heavy-set man in a dark suit and a slouched hat, fled from the scene. While Joseph managed to survive the attack, he died two days later from severe head trauma. That's very traumatic for those nieces again. All of these sites are so traumatic for not just... The people that they're the victims, and I think they're all victims, but yes. the people, the victims are being attacked. But anyone that witnesses something mm-hmm. like this to their loved one or just anyone in general, but yes. specifically your loved one, that changes the trajectory of your life. Yes. It is a, a horrible thing to reconcile. Absolutely. Especially if that's the person that took you in and you live with them. Yeah. It's not some distant or like you said, some stranger. So, man, it's and yet another grocer. And then you, yes, and you see him. This is the first time where he's been seen fleeing the scene. Yes, too. he's been he's been so spotted. eyes have been put on him. Law enforcement saw the similarities from the assaults and murders and began to piece together a profile of the killer. With each attack, the axe man's modus operandi was the same. A panel on the home's back door was removed by a chisel, 
and while it seemed he took great pains in removing the door panels, he always left the chisel behind. That seems almost like a taunting signature. Yeah, yeah, or just teasing. Like, but also back then, you couldn't get fingerprints. True, and this the chisel was very. It was um, like I said, this the railroad chisel or whatever, yes. and it was a fa- a favorite tool a burglars. of burglars. Yes, so maybe saying I can get a dozen of these. Right. Oh, anyway. yeah, very taunting. Victims were attacked by a razor or an axe, with the weapons always belonging to the victims themselves. Valuables and cash were also never stolen, eliminating robbery as a motive. Fingerprints were never found at the scene, but there was also no evidence that services had been wiped down. Authorities were left scratching their heads, with nothing about this case making sense. Sounds like a case for Sherlock Holmes! (laughs) What's interesting, too, and very confident and arrogant is to not take your own weapon with you. He never showed up to any of his victims' houses with his own weapons, so he is just going to rely on whatever tools he has. He's going to MacGyver this. And I wonder, too, if he chose houses that had chimneys and thinking mm. oh if you have to chop firewood yeah. everybody you know you'll have a you'll have an axe because you have to chop wood interesting that's an interesting theory well perhaps the most glaringly obvious connection between the attacks was that the majority of the victims were italian americans leading many to believe the attacks were racially motivated and uh, specifically italian grocers yes who lived above Bessemer their stores. Bessemer was Polish, but all the other ones have been mm-hmm. Italian. And they lived above their stores. During the 1900s, Italian-American immigrants were facing a wave of bigotry in the U.S. New Orleans was still fresh off the Civil War and rife with racism. The Italian business community had its place in New Orleans well before the Civil War, with the majority of the Italians headed to the Crescent City to set down roots coming from northern Italy. After the Civil War, the antebellum South was in need of cheap labor. Jobs on plantations were plentiful, and so Louisiana, and New Orleans in particular, saw an influx of Sicilians move to the city to work in the nearby sugar fields. In the 1880s and 1890s, over 80% of the Italian immigrants entering Louisiana were Sicilian. Just a decade later, New Orleans was home to about 20,000 Italians, making it the largest Italian community in the southern U.S. So they see this opportunity and they head to New Orleans to... The American dream. The American dream. Not content to stay sugar laborers for long, most Italians would save their wages and soon leave the back-breaking labor in search of the American dream, small business ownership. Flower shops and grocery stores began popping up all around by 1900. Well, and it's interesting because they worked in the sugar fields with Chinese and African-American people and... If you save enough money and you look Italian and you look maybe could pass for white, Mm. then you can go and open a business where it's not going to be as easy if you are visibly of another race. Right. Yes. New to the country and unaware of America's deep-seated racism against the newly free black community, Sicilians were friendly with the Chinese immigrants and recently freed slaves whom they worked beside, having no clue that this friendliness would be punished by the white sugar plantation owners who lumped them all together and targeted them for discrimination. There's a book I read called Working Toward Whiteness, and it's about how Italian, Polish, Irish, Scottish immigrants would then, you know, you sort of change your last name or you drop part of your last name name, or you try to change your accent so that you are not targeted to this discrimination that you come here and go, oh, my, you You can blend in. You treat people very badly. Pretend like you Yeah, whiteness is made up. It's not a thing. Being white is not a thing. No. It was created by people to try to harness power for themselves. What? That doesn't sound like a white man. Why would you do that? The New Orleans judge was quoted around the turn of the century as calling Italian Americans the most vicious, ignorant, degraded, and filthy papas. Well, that is. Like my New Orleans accent. I do. It sounds very. um... Don't say foghorn leghorn. (laughs) Please don't. Well, now that you say it, damn it, it does sound like foghorn like horn. Also, the, also, also, that that's foghorn like horn. That wasn't my first. Uh, it was very Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Was okay, who there I was you trying go. to there think of, which is a fantastic film, by the way. Kev, it's Kevin Spacey. I know, I know. Now I can't watch it, but well, John Cusack's also in it. Hey, boo. <laughs> the French Quarter soon became an insular Italian neighborhood. The locals called the area near Jackson Square and the Mississippi River Little Palermo after the capital city of Sicily, since the majority of those in the area who lived and worked nearby were Sicilians. Italian groceries began popping up quickly once the sugar laborers saved up enough money. 
the percent of Italian-owned groceries rose from 7% of all grocery stores in 1880 to 50% of all stores by 1920. So it was a pretty big rise. They were working hard. They were not, they were no, they were not shy to hard labor and and wanting to better themselves and better their lives, create a good life for their family. And take that, take that opportunity when they could. Although most Sicilians were upstanding business owners, others maintained some unsavory old world traditions like the vendetta. This led to a number of shootouts near the Sicilian neighborhood and increased rumors and violent stereotypes that Italians were criminals. There was, you know, uh, families versus families kind sure. of sort of similar mafia Godfather-ish, yes. yes. And then they would get in fights with the cops and there, yeah. So there were still some... I mean, the Italian mob and the mafia in general was a huge thing at this time. Correct, yes, at the time. City officials even began to speculate that the Axeman attacks might be mafia related, although this was never proven to be true. And then you never know, too, if they're getting like, oh, these Italians are getting too big for their britches. Maybe now this let's pin this on them. Let's say this is a mafia. It's probably a bunch of vendettas because it's, you know, easier to explain than a person who just has a bloodlust. Psychopath is just stalking. Someone (laughs) just has a bloodlust. Yes. It seemed like everyone had a different theory as to who the Axeman might be. Criminologists on the case suspected the killer was targeting women, only killing male victims if they got in the way or when the intended female victims were not home. Police became inundated with reports from local residents claiming to have seen the Axeman lurking in neighborhoods. Citizens believing they had discovered clues to help solve the killer's identity came forward claiming to have found axes and chisels in backyards and doors and windows with which had been tampered. Oh. So you got a little, a lot of vigilantes out, a lot of Look what junior I sleuths on the case yes. at this point. Look what I found. Residents of New Orleans were panicked and terrified. People began to carry loaded shotguns wherever they went. That's a reasonable response. <laughs> While family members decided to forego sleep to take turns keeping watch at night over their loved ones. Just paranoia. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You had to because you think, oh, I locked the door. Well, it doesn't matter. He's going to chisel they open the They didn't have door. alarms back then. They didn't mm-hmm. have Vivint. What's Vivint? Vivint is my alarm company. (laughs) Oh, nice. I have ADT. Yes, they didn't have Vivint or ADT. So they had loaded shotguns, though. Do you know what? We still have those. Yeah, we still have those, too. (laughs) A lot of people still use that as their Vivint and ADT. Also, uh, what is it? There's those signs you always see at a, you know, a craft fair, a Canton-esque kind of craft Mm -hmm. fair that says has a picture of a gun that says, we don't call 911. Mm, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of the old world way of dealing with See that a lot on my next door, too. Yes. Got a real, real hot, hot bed of it's something hot happened on my next door. It's a hot bed of mess. Yeah. Yeah. And then just like that, with the city armed to defend itself and law enforcement working round the clock to solve the serial killer's identity, the attacks and murders stopped just as suddenly as they had began. Over the next few months, the city seemed to return to normal. The general air of fear slowly lifted and residents of New Orleans started to feel like they were no longer being held hostage in their beloved city. Then on March 9th, 1919, that all changed when the Axeman struck again. So they had a couple of good months. They had, but even then, can you ever really relax? You're always on edge thinking, are we really safe? It's just, just when you thought it was safe to go back into the water, you know, (laughs) they got jaws. Yes. They got jaws jaws before jaws was a a thing. You got (laughs) jaws. Charles Cordemelia, an immigrant Italian grocer lived across the Mississippi River from New Orleans in the small town of Gretna with his wife, Rosie, and their two-year-old daughter, Mary. In the early morning hours of March 9th, Orlando Giordano, the Cordemelia's neighbor and fellow grocery store owner, heard screams coming from the family residence. Giordano rushed across the street to investigate and discovered the three had been attacked. According to Rosie, she woke in the night to find her husband struggling with a large man wielding an axe. As Charles fell to the floor, the attacker turned his attention to Rosie, who was clutching her small daughter, begging for their lives. This, I can't even begin to fathom this scene. It's so it's you're 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 woken up, shocked, you're sleepy, you have no idea what's happening, you're just thrown into the worst nightmare. You of your wanna life. help your husband, but you have your baby. Yes. But there's a crazy person that's you're, attacking you. Uh, what do you do? Yeah. Beg for your life, for sure. Definitely. And just try to, try to, you know, protect your kid. Protect your kid. Say, you know, lean over her or whatever. Mercilessly, the killer brought the axe down upon both Rosie and Mary. When Giordano arrived, he found Rosie, her face dripping with blood from the massive head wound. She was holding Mary, who tragically had not survived. Man, he took out the kid. 
Charles lay in a pool of his own blood on the floor. Yeah, this this guy had no problem killing a two year old. Not at all. No. Not that's, at all. That's very telling. A lot of times, serial killer, they have certain... The Golden they, State Killer was yes, like, go a, in the other room. Yeah, it's yeah. It's not about you. They have their... It's like prison rules. They yes. even... No matter how warped and horrific they are, they have these weird set of rules that they have to abide by. This guy did not seem to have those no, rules. No, it seemed almost frantic. Yeah. And it's the... Pro- like, he wants to just do it. Yes. Just a process killer. Yeah. Or the the opposite of a process killer. What I mean is... A lot of like Bundy, he killed them and did then did things, and it was like yes, he afterwards. wanted the product. Yes, the the killing part was kind of a, something he had to do to get to the product. Yes, this guy, he just wanted to kill. He just wants to kill. He just wants the and blood and the violence. GTFO. Yeah. yeah. Once again, authorities noted that nothing was stolen from the house, and that a panel on the back door had been chiseled away, and on the back porch of the home, the grisly discovery of a bloody axe. So he's living, leaving it behind. He doesn't. He, I'm, get, I'm telling you, he's taunting them. Mm-hmm. It's like, come and find me. You can't leave the chisel. Leave the axe. Take the cannolis. That's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Charles and Rosie were both rushed to the hospital and treated for skull fractures. A couple of days later, Charles was released while Rosie stayed and continued to be looked after by the doctors. Upon regaining full consciousness. Rosie shocked everyone when she stated that she was attacked by none other than the man who had found her, their neighbor, Irolando Giordano, and his 18-year-old son, Frank. Irolando was 69 years old, which in 1918 is fucking old. <laughs> it's like 120 in yeah, today. Yeah, you didn't live that long no. back then. Also, though, he had an 18-year-old son. He fucked. <laughs> Maybe it was by marriage. Nah. You think that was Dudes can biological? have babies still forever. Yeah, I know, but I'm just saying. The sperm swims good. Mm, sometimes. Well, it depends. Depends. So it sounds like, well, Irlando's, he's got his it. Were, he, he had some swimmers. Strong swimmers. As fellow grocers, the Giordanos were business competitors of the Court Amelias and had recently taken them to court over a business dispute. And while this may be a motive, claims were made that Rosie was pressured into making a false confession by the police, who had, in fact, locked her up as a material witness in the Gretna jail upon being released from the hospital. She was released only after she signed an affidavit implicating her neighbors. Pretty much they said they were interrogating her at the hospital and she's grieving her child. Yes. Horribly injured and in pain, probably on some kind of. They probably gave you opium back yeah, then, yeah. heroin, heroin, just straight and, up heroin. Yes, and who, who did this? I don't know. Was it? Orlando? You would say anything. I don't know. You, and then, you don't even care. Your daughter's dead. And then the she the, died in your arms. Yeah, I was to say the Smithsonian Magazine article I read. They said she got, she was ready to get out of the hospital, and they said, "Okay, are you ready to tell us it was Orlando?" She said, "No, it wasn't him. Yeah, I didn't really see the guy. I don't know. He may. Have, I don't know really what he looked like. They're like, you will sign this, and they took her to jail. Mm-hmm. You arrest a lady." Who lost her kid and got axed in the face. Yeah. You arrest her. So I think the reason that happened is they're just in dire straits to arrest anyone because the city's in such a panic. I mean, arrest the they, right person, though. They, or someone else they is just want, get I mean, we see it today. They just pin it on anybody to get someone to to close the case we and got him do it's that done. like in say in the exonerated five case first of all a bunch of people's lives are stolen second of all more people are attacked yes the, it's some a, a killers roaming the streets yes absolutely and poor old man giordano is decrepit and in jail despite irolando being 69 and in poor health frank weighing 200 pounds and unable to fit through the panel in the back door and charles denying his wife's claims Police arrested the father and son and charged them with the attacks and the murder of two-year-old Mary. After a trial lasting less than a week, the men were found guilty, with Orlando being sentenced to life in prison and Frank being sentenced to death by hanging. The only evidence they had was that signed yeah, affidavit that by Mary. That was it. I'm sorry, by Rosie. After the trial, Charles divorced Rosie. Nine months later, she retracted her previous statements, claiming St. Joseph had come to her in a dream, telling her to confess the truth. She had a guilty conscience. Rosie then signed another affidavit, this one saying she had not seen her attackers and had previously been coerced into falsely identifying the Giordanos. And the Times-Picayune happily published a statement from her as well. Times-Picayune. They were all up in this. They're still the newspaper in New Orleans. Well. Hanging on. 
Despite her new claims, the prosecution didn't want to drop the charges and even threatened Rosie with charges of perjury if she didn't stick to her original story. They're just trying to lock her up. Eventually, in December of 1920, the truth prevailed and the Giordanos walked free. Thankfully, they didn't hang Frank first. Oh my gosh. Yeah. The Axeman had brutally attacked and murdered another innocent Italian immigrant grocer and his family. Once again, the city of New Orleans was filled with terror. Man, they thought he was gone, and then he comes back and kills a child. Yeah, things have escalated. Yeah. The police were now publicly stating they believed the attacks and murders had been committed by one man, and that he was... A bloodthirsty maniac filled with a passion for human slaughter. That's what Foghorn Legend God thought. <laughs> I was trying to do a New Orleans accent. Unfortunately, they were still no closer to solving the identity of the killer. Just when it seemed like things couldn't get any more dire and alarming, the times picayune newspaper received an unnerving letter on March 14th, 1919, with promises of another bloody attack. It read, Esteemed mortal, they have never caught me and they never will. They have never seen me, for I am invisible, even as the ether that surrounds your earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. I am what you Orlinians and your foolish police call the Axeman. The author of the letter went on to say that he was a reasonable spirit and was not angry with the police, but rather amused at how they had conducted their investigation. However, he reminded readers, Let them not try to discover what I am, for it was better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the Axeman. The letter taunted residents of New Orleans, making it appear they should almost be grateful to the Axeman for not doing more harm than he already had. If I had wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, for I am in a close relationship with the Angel of Death. We're official on Facebook. <laughs> Being in a close relationship with the angel of death is kind of sweet, though. I mean, you, it's got its perks. It's got yeah. its perks. You call in favors if you need it. Yeah. You Man. know, you kind of get a heads up, maybe. Yes, something's if it's your, your turn. Way. Yeah. The words of the Axeman evoked fear in the hearts of all that read his sinister words, but none more so than the next. Now, to be exact, at 1215 Earthly Time on next Tuesday night, March 19th, I'm going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I'm going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time that I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well, then so much the better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is that some of your people who do not jazz it on Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Yours truly, the axe man. I'm sorry to laugh, but this is awful. I know. Jazz it. But jazz it is real fun. I'm trying to jazz it. And I'm going to start saying this. You should bring it back. What are you trying to do? I was trying to jazz I'm it. I'm trying to jazz it. What are you doing tonight? I don't know. Just jazz it. Probably going to jazz it. Probably. Ooh, girl, you look good. Thank you. Jazzing so it? I've been jazzing it. <laughs> he came to my, we were in the car. He was dropping me off after a date, and then he jazzed it. <laughs> That's from Seinfeld. <laughs> he took he it took out. It out. What do you mean? It. 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 He took it out. Such a good one. <laughs> he jazzed it. <laughs> um, 100% we're using this. And listeners, please feel free to also use this. <laughs> Hashtag jazz it. Jazz it. We're bringing it back. Jazz it out. Well, Orlinians did not heed these words lightly. And on the night of March 19th, the sounds of jazz filled the streets of the Big Easy. Music poured from homes in the French Quarter. Dance halls and bars were filled to capacity with both professional and amateur musicians wailing on their trumpets and saxophones, and hundreds of lively parties, veiled in fear, were held throughout the city. I mean, if you got a party, you got a party. Yeah. I mean, if somebody tells you you got a party or I'm going to kill you with an axe and you throw a Get party. Get your trumpet out or you want to die, man? <laughs> you fucking you die? fucking wail on your trumpet and you throw a banging party. Where's your fucking trumpet, Larry? You jazz it. You, you, do you want to jazz it? I don't want to die. I want to jazz it. We're jazzing it. We're jazzing it. 6.30 p.m. We're jazzing all night. It is unknown whether or not the Axeman visited that night, as no one was killed. Or perhaps he was there, walking the jazz-filled streets, and just made good on his promise. It's very controlling, though, feeling. You probably felt pretty powerful. Oh, fuck yeah. Everybody play music at 12.15? Yeah. You got a whole city under your thumb. Pretty much. 
Miriam Davis, author of The Axeman of New Orleans, The True Story, believes the real Axeman did not write the letter. The Axeman was almost certainly not a well-educated person. He was working class. He was probably a burglar. This was not a person who would be well-educated, but the person who wrote the letter was extremely educated. Which makes sense, I guess, if, you know, the the certain phrases that were used for I am in a close relationship, not just like, it I was, know the angel. It was, a, it was a haughty letter. It's very haughtily It written. was a very a, haughty a, letter. A man in gloves. Although, working class can still be well-educated, Miriam. <laughs> I mean, perhaps back then it was... You know who was working class and well-educated? Abraham Lincoln. Just there you saying. go. See? it's You can... Maybe back then it was more likely that if you were working class... You were not educated, but I think those two things aren't mutually exclusive. Or maybe just me, she means by like the lingo of like, they have never seen me for I am invisible, even as the ether. You know, it's sort of poetic. It's not flowery. like how a normal person would Correct. write. It's very flowery. Yeah. Well, so if the killer didn't write it, who did? Miriam believes that the writer of the letter also wrote something else. The definitive Axeman anthem of the day. The mysterious Axeman's jazz, Don't Scare Me Papa by composer John Joseph Davila. He made a pile of money off that song, Miriam said of Davila, who released his Axeman song shortly after the letter to the newspaper was published. That's like viral marketing of the day. That's genius. I mean, it's, if it wasn't the Axeman, that's pretty smart. He's like, I'm going to get rich, yeah. bitch. Yeah. That's also, genius. Especially another, knowing the Times Picayune would fucking publish anything yeah. that had Axeman on it. Another great Seinfeld is when Elaine knows all the big band music. <laughs> oh, yes. She's like... <laughs> She knew all the, the composer names and they're yeah. trying to win tickets. That's so good. <laughs> Anytime, don't scare me, Papa. It was a very... <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> big band n- name. That's right. Well, for the next few weeks, all was quiet, although the city was still gripped with fear. Then on August 19th, 1919, another Italian grocer, Steve Boca, was viciously attacked in his sleep. Just like Anna Schneider, the Axeman's pregnant victim, Boca woke in the night to a dark figure standing over his bed and was then forcefully struck on the head with an axe. Upon regaining consciousness, Boca ran to his neighbor's house where he collapsed and the police were called. So March to August. So he took the summer off. He was on holiday. He's satiated by the jazz. Maybe. Or I think, I wonder in if In my he, head, the reason I took a pause is I was thinking, why would he, why would he not be there for the summer? I was going to say, I was, I was thinking- Traveling salesman? Or he had some kind of job where he was on a yeah. boat. Maybe he was like a yeah. shrimper, and Ooh, that's okay. like shrimping season, yeah. and you're going to be gone from that time. Or he, yeah, he was some kind of traveling businessman that he came to New Orleans every now and then Or he work. rode the rails or something, because mm-hmm. he had a railroad chisel. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to solve the accident. We are. <laughs> We're going to solve this cold case. Suffering from a severe head injury, Boca was unable to remember the details of his attack. But the M.O. was classic Axeman, as nothing had been stolen from the home and a panel on the back door had been chiseled away, allowing the perpetrator to enter quietly. A few weeks later, on September 2nd, William Carson, a local druggist, may have been the only person to successfully escape the Axeman's wrath. Carson fired several shots at an intruder that had broken into his home, causing the intruder to flee. It was then discovered Carson's back door had been broken and an axe had been left behind. Ooh, he, so he preempted the axe attack. I guess that loaded shotgun was a good call. You know, we, it sounded unreasonable at first. <laughs> but Unfortunately, Sarah Lawman was not so lucky. With his thirst for blood left unquenched by Carson's quick defense, the axe man attacked young Sarah the following evening on September 3rd. Sarah lived alone, and when concerned neighbors came to check on her, discovered her unconscious on her bed. She had suffered a severe blow to the head and was missing several teeth. Outside on the front lawn, the weapon used in her attack was discovered, a bloody axe. Sarah suffered a brain concussion, but luckily recovered. Well, at least she lived. Here's another thing. A lot of his victims, he left with them still alive. Bleeding Which is still. interesting to me. Especially like the, the first attack, the Maggios, he used the razor on their throats and that's going to, I mean, you're going to kill somebody. Right. But some people, I mean, clearly they can survive getting whacked in the head. Several people have survived Multiple these people. axe attacks. An axe to your skull. Yeah, that's, phew. that's insane. But also the fact that he is leaving them and not making sure that they're mm-hmm. finished again Especially makes me think. Especially when he has an axe, think, he could just cut their head yeah, off. Yeah, he's, he's not, 
He's just in it for like the rush of bam, violence bam, 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 bam. of just doing something. It's that rush, the immediate thing, and then the he's release. done with it. Yeah, he he doesn't really. He's not even sticking around to make sure he did kill them, so he's not identified. Yeah, he just he just wants that the action. Armed residents once again took up watch, concerned they would be the Axeman's next target. Authorities continued to work the case, but were still no closer to arresting someone than they were a year and a half ago when the nightmare began. Then, on October 27th, 1919, the Axeman would strike for the last time. Five nights before Halloween, Mike Pepitone's wife heard a noise coming from their bedroom. When she went to investigate, she saw her husband covered in blood and a large, axe-wielding man fleeing the scene. Sadly, Pepitone would not survive, leaving his wife and six children behind. His wife was unable to recall any identifying characteristics of the attacker. That must be, you feel so guilty because you're in the moment, yeah. you're trying to help, I guess. And well, what'd you see? <sighs> like your husband on the floor. Yeah, that's all you're focused that's on. That's what you see. Yeah. It's also, I, I in all my reading, I didn't really ever read how he was fleeing. I think in one time it was out of a window. Mm -hmm. I know that when the two girls discovered their uncle, one of them was quoted as saying he was surprisingly quick on his feet. Like he could just get away so quickly, hmm. which is interesting. But to be doing it and then be able to just run away. Just stop. And and not be really identified or even tackled to the ground and caught. You know, there's just a lot of he's not really thought out. There's not a lot of planning of trying not to get caught. I He's, think so. He doesn't seem concerned with getting caught. I have a hot take. Love to hear it. I don't think this was the axe man. Oh, I think okay. he would have axed the wife. When she walked in? Yeah. Interesting. He didn't He didn't axe the two nieces, though. He was, I thought he was already running by the time the nieces came in. There's conflicting stories. That he'd Some done, his, say he he'd done his business and was half out the window and they came in and he just kept going? Yeah. If he was doing it... Well, it says, I guess it says a large axe-wielding man fleeing the scene... But I, th I don't think it was. I don't think Pepper John did. While the M.O. of this crime once again pointed to the axe man, some believe he was not the one responsible for this murder, but rather that it was the outcome of a long-standing vendetta. To be fair, they did say officers arrested somebody and they charged him with this that wasn't the axe man. Oh, imagine that. But they seemed to be doing that a lot. And then so let guess, him go a few days later. I think they kept him. But again, I don't think that really points to his guilt. Right. Others believe Pepitone's murder was the last work of the Axe Man. Then again, some police records indicate the killer went on to take the lives of four others between December of 1920 to April of 1921 in various cities throughout Louisiana. The final attack appearing to have been in April of 1921, when Frank Scalisi, an Italian grocer, was attacked with an axe in his own grocery store in Lake Charles. So I think that the Axe Man moved. I think he, maybe Mike Pepitone, he did, but... After that, there's the way, if you look on a map, I put up a map and you can plot out that he was clearly moving from city to city. Mm -hmm. And then for whatever reason, Frank Scalisi in 1920, April 1921 was, that was the last one. Unless there are some attacks that happened in Texas because he was moving west towards Texas. There's also a detective that says a lot of axe attacks that happened in 1911 were actually the first series the first series of his were they in new orleans or they were elsewhere they were i think somewhere in new orleans and somewhere elsewhere but in the very first murder in new orleans the police found a note or not even a note just on the sidewalk written in chalk a message that said joseph maggio will sit up tonight much like and then it gave the name of a victim that had been killed in 1911 with an axe ah so these weren't even his first murders. well some say he was just referencing that and trying to throw police off the trail mm. this one detective thinks they were connected yeah who will ever know yeah will ever solve the crime because he didn't really leave anything behind I mean, he left the axes, but I'm saying he sure. didn't leave, like, DNA behind. Right. There was no. no fingerprints. They wouldn't have, yeah. And I guess if they had held on to it all these years, they might could have done something with it, but they'd never it found it. It degrades over time, yeah. There you go. The axe man's brutal reign took the city of New Orleans and its residents by storm, specifically Italian grocery store owners. While the killer was never apprehended, the Big Easy eventually regained a sense of normalcy, with Italian immigrant businesses continuing to thrive. Throughout the years, there has been much speculation on the identity of the mass murderer. 
the New Orleans chief of police believed the attacks were the work of a fiend struck with the urge to kill and with no control to stop himself. What experts today would call a serial killer. So Pretty they didn't much. even really use the term serial killer back mm -mm. then. It was just a guy with bloodlust. Yeah. Because of how easily the Axeman was able to gain entry to the victim's residences, police reasoned he was an experienced burglar, especially since he used a railroad shoe pin to gain entry, a common tool of burglars. According to witnesses, the Axeman was a white male, approximately 30 years old, with a working class background. However, Joseph Romano's nieces described him as a heavyset, dark-skinned man, and Harriet Lowe described him as biracial. So there's conflicting reports. Lots of conflicting reports. Well, we'll never know. None of the Axeman's victims or witnesses were able to get a good look at him. But Edouard Martel, a French photographer who traveled across the USA in the early 20th century, may have unknowingly captured a photo of him. Oh, it's Bigfoot. Nessie, <laughs> he got him. The photo was one of many Martel had taken while testing his new invention, a camera with automatic exposure settings and shutter mechanism attached to an adjustable timer. He had quite a little contraption traveling with him. Martel passed away in 1955, penniless after his invention never took off. This was the original selfie cam. <laughs> his daughter, Jean, later ran across the photo in an old box of his belongings. The photo is dated October 28, 1919, and shows a row of homes along an empty New Orleans street. It appears to have been taken in the early morning hours and, while blurred, shows a man entering one of the houses. What happened on that day? The photo has since been posted on Reddit's paranormal-themed X-Board. An internet sleuths claim the house depicted in the picture is that of Mike Pepitone's, the Axeman's supposed last victim, uh, which is the same day he was murdered. Uh, the world may never know the true identity of the Axeman or his motive for brutally killing at least six people and severely injuring many more. Many have likened him to an American version of Jack the Ripper, with some even speculating they may be the same person. Whoa. So what do we think? Oh, my gosh. You think he could be Jack the Ripper? You think they could be the same? I don't think so. I feel like if there was a British person lurking around, people would, uh, you know, an unsavory British person, they would point him out. You think? Maybe not. I don't know. It's a melting pot down in New Orleans. Yeah. People from all over. I think it's probably not the same person. Probably not. But, but perhaps inspired by? You never know. Jack the Ripper? You have these feelings and then you see somebody else is doing it and you think, fuck it, I'm just going to do yeah. it myself. And if, you know, Jack the Ripper was attacking sex workers mm -hmm. and there was a, a lot of them in London at the time and maybe the Axeman thought there is this huge influx of Italian grocers. There's plenty of them. Okay. And I'll target, the, yeah. you know, targeting a booming community a booming population it is interesting why they were targeted mm -hmm. if it was racially motivated or he had some he he was some sort of other grocery owner and it was just yeah uh, 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 taking the competition out it seems it seems too violent to be business motivated yeah because you could easily shoot or stab somebody and get it over with. This beating... It's a very personal, intimate way to kill and someone. very violent. Bloodlust. And physically taxing. Yes, yeah. To wheel... Axes are heavy. To yeah. To bring them down on somebody, that's... It's pretty heavy. So I, I think it was somebody that was motivated by the act itself. Yeah. Wanted to get that blood all over the place, feel that feeling, and either subconsciously targeted Italian grocers or, like I said, consciously thought, man, Italian groceries sure have been popping up all over. They won't miss them. You know, that yeah. just kind of thinking, maybe trying to rationalize it in an irrational brain, which the, it sounds their like victims had. no one will miss. So therefore, Something like it's that. less likely I'll be caught. Some racially motivated like that. of like, yeah. Well, there didn't used to be this many Italians and now there are. And that's a, a new area. You know, that's a population that, frankly, the rich, wealthy white people were trying to kind of stifle so you never know. Maybe he was a member of that, or I don't know. Do you know. think he was working class or a rich, wealthy? I think white he man. was maybe definitely a burglar because of how good he was at breaking in. Mm -hmm. I don't think he wrote the letter. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think so. I think either. that the letter was either Davila, whatever Joseph James Davila, jo John James, da yeah, the music the guy, composer, yes, or uh, like a, somebody that just wanted to get in the yeah. fray. Because, like I said, the picking kind of a just real went. Harriet Lowe. Getting out there, getting your, getting the word out there, and yeah. um, I, I think he was. It's weird that the physical descriptions vary. I won't say wildly, but very pretty, 
you know, people would say, oh, I saw a guy leaving that house and it was a thin white man and he looked wealthy. Well, it's like that doesn't mean it was the axe man. The people that actually saw him said that he had a darker complexion. Was he Italian and he just had been out in the sun a lot? Was he a biracial? Was he, you know, so I think that he at least had a criminal background because of how good he was at breaking in. I also think that he worked a working class job that took him out of the city for prolonged periods because I think he had too much of an impulse to kill that it wouldn't say, I'll just take off three months at a time. I think it was, well, I, man, I can't wait to get back and ask some people. And like you said, perhaps these murders were happening in other states where he maybe were traveling, but they just weren't connected. Taking the train or whatever. Because yeah. I think when I plotted it out, it was very clearly happened a, a city very a short distance from New Orleans and then a little bit further from that one and a little bit further from that one and time wise mm -hmm. it was about every three months or six months so maybe he's like a migrant worker or something like that and you know because he would have to be strong to lift the axe and have to be thin so he wouldn't be like a you know a big fat rich person that right. you know back in the day that kind of like barren Yes, of eating. You know, oh, Henry, oh, oh. Henry the Eighth kind of yeah. a person. You know, he would be th wiry and thin from working outside and from being able to wield the axe and get through those little tiny. And that would make him quick on his feet. Quick on his feet, small to fit through. You know, the little squares yeah. that he was chiseling out. So I don't know. Well, That's my profile. Let us know what you guys think, and don't forget to jazz it. Jazz it, jazz it, you guys. Jazz it up. Keep it creepy. No, not anymore. Jazz it, jazz it. <laughs> We have some fun appearances coming up that we're very excited about. Yes. You can catch us alongside some other awesome podcast hosts on the Badass Ladies Behind the Mic podcast panel, Thursday, August 1st from 6 to 8 p.m. in Dallas. We are thrilled to announce that on August 22nd at Intera Bank Books in Dallas, Texas, we have the honor of interviewing the acclaimed true crime writer and co-host of the podcast Murder Squad, Billy Jensen, about his new book, Chase Darkness With Me. We would love to see you there, and we have more details for you at SinisterHood.com forward slash links. Yes, information on both those events can be found there. Well, Sinisterhood will always remain free, but if you wish to donate to our Patreon to help offset the cost of making and hosting the show you can visit SinisterHood.com and click on Patreon in the top right corner. You'll get some sweet perks like Patreon-exclusive content, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group, a special shout-out on the show, and a monthly bonus mini-sode. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. Also, many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Please never stop. If you want to get some cool Sinisterhood swag like t-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click on Shop in the top right corner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. And tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps small podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Christy, where are you at? I am on Twitter at Christy or GTFO and I am on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace Heather. I am on Instagram at Heather vs. The World and on Twitter at MCK vs. The World. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. And jazz it. <laughs> High five. <laughs> hey, everybody. Thanks so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your Patreon shout outs. Megan Wasson. Allison Belden. George Brown. George Brown. That's my father-in-law. Thank you. Love you. Aubrey Loveman. Melissa. And Elizabeth Swenson. Thanks so much, you guys. And be sure to check your mail because we are sending out your Sinisterhood stickers this week. Thanks so much. Keep it creepy. Mwahahaha. <laughs> Sin